Hey y'all, I am a details guy, and the Willamette Charger build has got a lot of them. And so we're going to dive deep into chassis prep on this episode. We'll cover how I capture the critical dimensions off the Rev1 chassis, how that informs the Rev2 design, and finally, we're going to prep this hunk of junk so I can safely remove the current frame and last bits of the original unibody. It's all vital foundational stuff, and as we know, there are no shortcuts. There's a lot to cover, so stick around. A little bit of background. This is my 1970 Dodge Charger. I picked it up some years ago, and it was a bit rough. More so than I first thought. Sanding through the filler and cutting out the rot and bad bodywork revealed even more. And it became clear that I would need to drop any notion of a day two type build and look at this much more as a ground up sort of endeavor. And so that's exactly where we are. The car is blasted, epoxy primed, and I'm getting ready to build my version of a pro touring frame and chassis. It's a design I'm calling Rev2. But first things first, we've got to measure the car as it is. Even though I'm updating the design, the general proportions will be about the same as original. So I clamped my tape measure to the table and used a T-square to set zero in alignment with the front of the frame rail. From there, using a square plumb bob, I translated each of the critical features of the car down to the table, capturing the measurement from the tape and making a mark on the table as well. This method all but eliminates variation due to the wiggle at the end of the tape measure and controls for something called tolerance stacking. It's important to take your time, make a bunch of notes, because small errors here will show up much later in the build process when they're more difficult to correct. Just for reference, I ended up measuring and adjusting my design seven times before giving the go-ahead to bend the tube. We've got a plan, dimensions, and a drawing. Now we can start building the temporary structure to which the unibody will mount. So, we've got to make a material run to my local metals supermarket. They're my go-to for small volume purchases, and I try to take full advantage of their shearing and cutting services to maximize my assembly time back at the shop. I drew up the basic dimensions for the uprights and had them do the large mitering cuts as well. Recall this is a unibody structure, so there's no frame underneath the car, or at least not originally. What I'm gonna do is secure this car at two critical points on the unibody. This is not in any particular order. This is where the roof structure comes down, and this is actually a nice big strong bulkhead. So I'm gonna put a plate right here, and then I'm gonna have a cross member come up from the frame table and grab onto that feature right there. And it'll be a U-shaped from the opposite side of the car, running underneath it, and then coming up to grab both ends of that uh, and then securing it. Same thing, same exact idea. A U-shape, almost like a football upright, is gonna come up and grab this flat spot where the door uh, hinges mount. Door hinge one and two, and then this nice perfect flat spot. Mount a plate here, extend out, and the upright will be right here so that the car and its shape and dimension is secured externally. And when you get the, the body and all that shape locked down, I should be able to cut out the entire frame from front to back, and then very, very carefully, without using a lot of air hammer, quite frankly, slide the thing out the front. One of the tools that I really like for cutting through steel like this uh, used to be my angle grinder, a big six inch, and, and, and I still use that a lot, it cuts. 
but there's a nice set of tools that have been coming out and become really very affordable. And it's essentially circular saws that are designed uh, to cut metal. So they've got a high amp motor and they've got the right blade for it. Um, this one's by Evolution. And I've already got it set up for steel. And so that's what we're gonna use. Uh, it's pretty cool. You go nice and slow. Doesn't add a lot of heat to the work and it's an extremely precise cut. Uh, I wanna get their chop saw next. I don't quite have that one. And uh, it's a good piece of gear. <laughs> There are a lot of ways to build this type of reinforcement structure. Since we're working from the frame table already in place, this birdcage sort of construction just made sense to me. And while I'm taking care to get these uprights really darn close to perfectly level, they don't have to be exact, because they're not a reference point for the chassis design, and are really only there to stabilize and hold the body in shape. What does have to be perfectly parallel and flat is the table itself, because that's what you're always taking dimensions on. Everything that's in the bracing sort of world, it's not going to be perfectly square because what you're comparing it to or what you're latching it to uh, are parts and, and dimensions on the car that need to remain somewhat flexible. So you're going to be trying to bend some of these things at a 90 already just to get it to push and suck into the car. Let me show you maybe a little better way to explain that. This part right here, has actually got quite a bit of sideways movement in it. It seems like it's very structural and rigid right now, and it is, because it's tied to this inner rocker. Well, even with the new chassis, you need to allow for this thing to stretch in and out by really and truly across the two as much as an inch. Even though the shell is secured to the birdcage, it needs to maintain just a little bit of wiggle room so it conforms to the Rev2 frame when the two merge together. Just as soon as the uprights are tacked, it's time to string them together at the top. Like any other basic assembly, keep all the beams level and vertical, and leave room to make adjustments. I shot this video over the course of two weekends, and that only gets us up to the birdcage construction, so don't rush the process. Quick recap. We measured the existing unibody, captured the critical dimensions and translated those to the new chassis design, and built the birdcage that will hold this car in suspension. 
while it waits patiently for the Rev2 chassis to be assembled and installed. And about that Rev2 design, I sent it to Jimmy at MRC Fabrication in Walnut Cove, North Carolina. He has got the knack for bending up 4x2 and has done a lot of work in the C10 crowd, so my design was no big deal for him. We'll preview how those rails piece together next time. Until then, I wanted to respond to a few questions and comments y'all had from the TIG welding episode, and I thought it would be pretty cool to include a friend in the process. So, my buddy Carl, who is a new TIG welder, sat down and joined me. It was the end of a hot Texas summer day, so he brought some refreshments that relate to his full-time gig, which is pretty neat. But I'll let him tell y'all about that. Um, I'm one of the co-founders of the Manhattan Project Beer Company, um, getting ready to open our our own facility. We've been in the market for about three years, but we're getting ready to open up our own place with our tap room production here in a few weeks. And um, yeah, so we make beer. That's what we do. They make great beer. Now, the reason I know Carl is they used to, uh, he and his wife used to live in the same neighborhood uh, that, that we're still in. The very first gig, when I wasn't just building something for myself, the very first gig that I did under the Willamette Motor and Fabrication uh, name was building the, working with, with Carl and, and Jeremy, their head brewer, to build the test rig, the small batch brew system uh, for their original brew house. and Which their, got installed a couple days ago, actually. It's at the new spot? Yep. It is in place at the new spot. Yeah. I, was about to, I was about to wonder out loud if y'all still were going to use that. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That's awesome. We had an interesting constraint because it had to be mobile, which yeah. is typically for, I mean, it's a pilot system or a test system, but it's a large, it's a three barrel, so it's 100 gallons at a time. Yeah. And normally those are fixed. And so we had to figure out how to, and they also had to be transportable and power coatable and everything. Yeah. So, yeah, we had to figure out how to make it to where it could be assembled and pinned together and rolled around a, yeah rolled around on the on the brew house floor and so yeah this is a cool project um a couple of y'all asked some great questions following the welding video uh it'll become apparent as to why carl's here for, for that in just a moment but i'll go through them real quickly uh khn denmark uh hi i would like to know more about your welding table uh, a buddy of mine named david demois uh you can find him on instagram d demois he does welding tables and mobile welding on the side but he makes uh, a really good value version of what you can typically buy from like weldtables.com or something like that. He makes a slightly heavier and, and very customized version of, of that type of welding table. The difference in like a real high-end welding table where it's machined and all the holes are like exactly a particular dimension, he uses a laser dimension. And for regular folks like us, that's perfectly good. That's 95% of what you need and, and, and you're, you'll get going. So. Hit him up and he can build you something for sure. Um, Banglar Goodman, uh, I'm interested in this work, but I'm Bangladeshi, and I think I think you're asking how can I get into this kind of work, meaning like welding and just fabricating in general. And you've got some welding certifications. There was a piece of advice given to me by by somebody that says just start and take every single job you can at the very very beginning. Every single one, you're going to learn something from all of them. So. Uh, I would say look around, and I'm not trying to like blow off and use a quote, but based on what I can I'd tell from your comment, use what you have, start where you are, do what you can, and uh, just form a network of, of uh, folks that, that maybe need your kind of welding services, and um, put yourself out there, start just building on your own, and um, and go do go do what you can. Can I can I throw in a little color comment there? Please do. Uh, I was talking to somebody the other day, a younger person, and they were some sort of similar question, like, how do I do this? How? Yeah. I said, well, man, I, I really don't know. I can't give you specific advice, but I just know if you work seven hours a day, seven days a week, uh, from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m., yeah. something good is bound to happen. So, yeah. <laughs> I mean, like, you gotta put in, got to put in the hours. Is Carl going to be your friend forever, sweetie? 
Okay, uh, picking back up. Uh, Felipe Rodriguez asks, which gas flow rate were you using in this cube exercise? And there's a point where I said I've got my, I'm using 80% of my pedal travel. So he's asking what the actual amperage was. My machine was set to 120. I'm ballparking 80%, just kind of where my foot is. I never matted the pedal in that, uh, doing that exercise. So probably 100, maybe 110 um, would, it, would be the amps. And that's, by the way, plenty enough. It's a 1 8 inch open corner, and that's plenty of, of current to be able to, to melt that quite nicely. It, it'll heat so pretty quickly, and you'll be able to dab all the way. So 100, 110 amps. And then my uh, gas flow rate, I'm using a Furic uh, number 12 FUPA cup, ceramic. Ceramic doesn't matter, but the number 12 cup with a gas lens. And that takes a lot of argon, and it's on an open corner. Depending on what I use that cup for, I'm between 30 and 35 cubic feet per hour on that particular one. And you get, my opinion, based on what I'm doing, argon's pretty cheap when you think about how long it'll last you. And you get great coverage and the good coloration as you're as you're going through. So uh, that's what I'm using. Smaller cups would, would use less, like a number eight cup, probably 20 cubic feet per hour. Um, wait, wait. So what, what did you have your flow rate at? I had that one when 30? I was doing this video, 35. 35. Because it's an open corner, and so gas ends up running away. Yeah, yeah. And I don't know, I can't remember if it's in the video, but I'll use some of those one by two by three blocks that I get. You can call them chill blocks, but they're like not precision or anything like that. You can set one of those on the top. Um, actually, my friend Ian gave me this idea and it holds the gas in. So you've got this cube, you set the chill block right here and it will hold the gas back for a little bit to create a little bit more of like a, a pocket of argon. And uh, 35 cubic feet per hour is plenty for that, but you get this open corner, gas wants to run away. You do have to kind of just throw the argon at it. But you can use some tools to get away with maybe 30, you know, if you're down to your very end of your tank or something like that. Easily one of the best things about the creator community, whether it's cars or welding or beer, is the folks you get to meet and learn from along the way. Like whenever Carl and I get together and chit chat, it tends to go late. He and his partners at Manhattan Project Beer are just genuinely interesting people and so it's easy to go on a mind walk when we all get together. Be sure to check them out. Links are in the description. Y'all take care. <laughs> She's fast, man. <laughs> She's fast. <laughs> oh. I'm glad you came by, man. Uh, it's always fun catching up, and, and you bring tasty refreshments. Yeah, we went through a couple of them. Yeah. Um, I think you can probably tell if I if I edit this. Yes. You yes. know, it'll be out of sequence. It'll be like one can, four cans, two cans. I think it'll I think it'll it'll be pretty obvious, but. I'm glad you came by, and it's always good to see you, man. Hey, good to see you, man. Take it easy. Appreciate it. Yeah.